Hey guys, welcome back to today's video. Today is Friday, January 7th, 2022, and today we'll be questioning whether or not the Democratic Party is adequately prepared for the 2024 United States Senate elections. And the reason why I ask this is because these Senate elections are likely going to be a bloodbath for the Democratic Party. And disregarding whatever happens in the 2022 midterm elections, Democrats are going to be in for a very rude awakening come the 2024 Senate elections. Looking at the 2022 national environment, the Democratic Party probably isn't too, at least, hopeless when it comes down to the Senate results. Looking at my own uh, recent projection in the United States Senate, Democrats at a low point would be down 54 to 46. Now, in my most recent projection, that actually has changed, and Democrats are at uh, in the minority at 53, with Republicans winning, 247. Now, that wouldn't exactly be the worst point for the Democratic Party, but it would put them in a position where it would be very difficult in 2024 to have any type of advancement over the GOP. And considering that 2022 is expected to be hotly contentious, Democrats really don't benefit from anything that happens in 2022 besides them expanding in the majority. Even if they hold on to 50-50, it's practically a done deal that two years later, they will end up losing those exact Senate seats to the 2024 regularly scheduled election. Now, looking at the 2024 map, it's actually the exact same map that we saw in 2018, disregarding a few special elections. I believe in 2018, there was a special election in Minnesota, Mississippi, and Arizona, all of which that were on the ballot again in 2020. Looking at the 2018 Senate elections, you will find that the Democratic Party actually performed pretty well. They were able to hold on to a number of these seats, and it was largely due to the fact that Donald Trump was an unpopular president. Now, looking at the 2022 environment, that is not the same. Joe Biden is unpopular. Democrats are falling to Republicans. Republicans in the advantage in the generic ballot for the first time since January of 2016. So Republicans are back on track for victory in 2022. And uh, 2024 doesn't look too bright, at least right now for the Democrats. But of course, as we all know, a lot can change in American politics in such a brief period of time. But in 2018, it was individually a very strong year for the Democrats, and they were able to win a number of competitive races and states that Donald Trump won in the 2016 election. For instance, Democrats were able to win in Arizona, Montana, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia. All seven of these states were won by Donald Trump in the 2016 election. In addition to that, Democrats were competitive in North Dakota, Missouri, Indiana, and Florida. They actually had an incumbent in Florida. In addition to that, Democrats were slightly competitive in Tennessee, very competitive in the Mississippi Senate special election relative to Mississippi's previous voting history. Extremely competitive in Texas, where Ted Cruz only defeated Beto O'Rourke by less than three percentage points across this previously ruby red state. So 2018 was a good year for Democrats, but even in a good year, they lost two Senate seats. And that's because this map is so lopsided against the Democratic Party that it really uh, makes it unable for them to win a number of these seats. And as we enter into 2024, nothing is going to change from this exact Senate map. This is exactly how it's going to look unless there's some type of last minute vacancy that prompts a special election between the time of now and the 2024 Senate elections. And the reason why when we see this 2024 map, that Democrats should be worried and that Democrats should start preparing for what is going to be potentially the worst is the fact that most of these races are automatically going to flip red because of partisanship. If you take a look at the electoral history in these states, I mean, look at the year 2000. This was the first year in the 21st century where we had these exact Senate seats up, and it was a pretty good election for the Democratic Party. I'm not going to lie to you. Now, the majority wasn't strong. In fact, coincidentally, if you take a look at this majority, guess what it was? In the 2000 Senate elections, Democrats and Republicans were 50-50, exactly where we are today. So Democrats briefly had control when uh, Al Gore was the vice president and then promptly resigned, of course, because his term was over. And then taking a look at the uh, Senate elections there, they flipped over to Republican control, but it was 50-50 at this time. Now take a look at this map and tell me this is not the weirdest thing you have ever seen, right? You have Vermont, Rhode Island, and Maine all red, but then you have Nebraska, North Dakota, and Missouri blue. I mean, this is probably one of the weirdest weirdest looking maps that I've seen so far, but that's just how the Senate elections were back then. Different coalitions, different regions, and ultimately better results for Democrats in areas that they no longer perform as well in, and obviously better results for Republicans in areas they no longer control. 
But the point is that 2000 wasn't enough to shift uh, so many partisan people away from voting for the opposition party than how they voted on the presidential level. For instance, in the state of North Dakota, Nebraska, and Missouri, they all voted for George W. Bush, but voted for Democrats on the Senate level. The same thing in the state of West Virginia. Same thing in Georgia and Florida. In fact, Florida was a pickup for Democrats, despite the state itself going to uh, George W. Bush. Vermont, Rhode Island, Maine, all voted for uh, Al Gore in this election. So what you see here is that the results are very different than the presidential election. And one thing you might notice is that partisanship simply didn't get to a lot of these candidates. They were still able to win despite the state voting directly in the opposite direction on the presidential level. In 2006, you exhibited the Democratic Party's strong performance in the Senate elections again. They were able to win in Nebraska again. They were able to win in West Virginia, Florida, uh, sorry, Ohio, Montana, North Dakota, New Mexico, Virginia, all states that voted for uh, George W. Bush in the 2004 election that went blue in 2006. But arguably, it was a blue wave year. In 2012, things were about uh, even. You know, Republicans and Democrats had an equal shot at the presidency, and Obama ultimately overcame Mitt Romney, but did not defeat him by a larger margin in the popular vote than Biden did over Trump, but did so in the electoral vote count. That largely came because Obama was able to win Ohio and Florida, whereas Biden was not. But looking at the Senate election results in a presidential election year, that Mitt Romney was winning Indiana by double digits, that Mitt Romney was winning Missouri by double digits, that Mitt Romney was decimating Obama in West Virginia, North Dakota, Montana. The results all came in positively for the Democratic Party. And that's the big thing about this. The Democrats were able to win in a lot of these races that Republicans were decimating them on the national ballot. Even in some of these governor and House elections, Republicans were solidly winning, but Democrats were lucky. Then came 2018, and Democrats weren't as lucky. In the same map that they were able to gain one seat in 2012 and avoid a cataclysmic defeat that Republicans were actually expecting to win the Senate in 2012, looking at 2018, despite the national environment being completely lopsided in favor of the Democrats, they ended up doing well but fell short of their expectation of reclaiming the majority. You see, they might have been able to hold on to Indiana, Missouri, and North Dakota, but the margins were getting narrower and narrower and narrower as the years went on. And that's what ultimately resulted in these states by 2018 shifting towards the right enough that Republicans were able to win. North Dakota was decided by just a few percentage points in 2012, then went to the Republicans by 10 points in 2018. Keep in mind, it's voting 30 points to Donald Trump, meaning there was still a significant amount of crossover support, but there isn't enough. And bipartisan voting and uh, non-down-ballot voting seems to be something that is changing and for the worse for those members of the opposition party in states that seem to be moving in a certain direction that is against their own interest. And as hyper-partisanship takes hold of this nation, it is less likely that we have cross senators. In fact, when you take a look at our Senate map from 2000, uh, the 2020 election, there are very few senators that were elected in states that the opposition party was able to win. And I think that for the Democrats, out of all of the states that Joe Biden won on the presidential level, there was a singular victory for the Republicans in all of those states in the Senate elections, and it was Susan Collins in the state of Maine. As for the rest of the map, you simply couldn't find it. So looking at this Senate map from 2018, the immediate losses that you can already estimate are in West Virginia, a state that Joe Manchin, while handedly winning by in 2012, came very close to losing. And in 2018, he wasn't even facing a super strong candidate. Patrick Morrissey, I would argue, did not fight for this race as strongly as he could have, and Republicans weren't really supposed to be competitive. But for Joe Manchin to only win by 3.3%, arguably it shows that the governor and now senator's former grip on the state seems to be withholding. And six years later, I don't expect it to get much better. For the state of Ohio, Sherrod Brown was able to defeat Jim Renaki. Now, I think that this is a race that could end up going for Democrats in 2024, if they are able to overcome potentially a Donald Trump type of election. I think that if another Republican is on the ballot, Democrats will be able to luck out in this Senate election. I think, you know, looking at Donald Trump's margin versus previous Republicans, they're not comparable because Trump brought out a significant portion of that, ba that base and moved them towards the right. But they clearly, as you can see in 2018, weren't right wing enough to vote for Republicans in every election. And they reelected Sherrod Brown. Now, looking at the state of Montana, John Tester won against Matt Rosendale, who is now the governor of the state, by a margin of less than four points. John Tester is probably going to have a very, very harsh re-election in 2024. If he's able to win, I think it will be a very good victory for the Democratic Party, not entirely out of the question, but definitely not the expectation.
Democrats no longer have the grip on these states like they used to. Montana could go towards John Tester, but I think it's going to become very difficult, especially when you think about the electoral history of Montana in recent time. While it does seem to be narrowly moving towards the left, the state itself is still overwhelmingly Republican, and to see John Tester winning re-election will take some serious cross-voting across the presidential ballot. And keep in mind that presidential ballots are where you see the most down-ballot voting. Now, taking a look at the rest of this map, you might argue, okay, Democrats won all of these remaining states in the 2020 election, so why wouldn't they be able to hold on to all of these seats? But keep in mind that you might have retiring incumbents. In addition to that, you are still going to see competitive races because the states that Democrats won in the 2020 election weren't exactly these solid blue states, at least for the ones that we would take into consideration. Nevada, Arizona, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, all states that were decided by less than five percentage points. And those are five seats that Democrats currently hold that they could potentially lose in 2024. If Republicans can find a stellar candidate in Pennsylvania, a stellar candidate in Michigan, Wisconsin, Arizona, and Nevada, what's to say if there is a Nikki Haley, if there's a Donald Trump, if there's a Mike Pence, if there's a Ron DeSantis on the ballot, and they win the race on the presidential level, what's to say the state won't go red on the Senate level? And that would ruin the Democratic Party's chances at a future type of election. If we were to take the current estimation that I have for the 2022 midterm elections, I have 53 Republicans and 47 Democrats. It's not depicted here because it's not fully updated, but it will be hopefully soon. But 53 to 47. Keep that in mind. Let's go back to 2024. While we're looking at the 2018 map, let's just use you know what, this map for an example. Looking at the 2024 map, what do we notice already? We see that there is Montana and West Virginia. These are two states that, let's say, a Republican wins on the presidential ballot that could go to the uh, GOP on the Senate level. And that puts them at a map where Republicans are in the advantage, 55 to 45, already a very strong majority. But it doesn't end there. What's uh, the case if Ohio goes, right? What's the case if maybe Arizona reverts back to its previously Republican strong position? What if Nevada goes? Moving alongside the state of Arizona, that puts Republicans at 58 Senate seats. And you might be saying, this is not possible. But all it would take is a red wave in 2024, and Democrats are set back 6 to 10 years when it comes down to these Senate elections. So that would put the Republicans already at 58. But let's say that red wave extends to some other states. You know, let's say it extends to states such as Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. And where does that put the Republican Party? 61 Senate seats. I mean, just based off of the races that were competitive in the 2020 election, Republicans could end up getting 61 Senate seats. But again, if you're talking about a worst case for Democrats, this is where the map really gets very tricky. You have Virginia, you have Minnesota, and you have the state of New Mexico. And if all of these states decided, okay, we're going to vote for a Republican this time, just going to be one election, a wave against Joe Biden, a wave against Democratic Party leadership, the trifecta that they had and didn't carry through through 2022, but uh, a trifecta that they did have at some point, Republicans could end up winning. And this is a real possibility. I'm not, you know, this is not some type of pipe dream for the GOP. If they have a red wave in 2024, uh, similar to 2016, just more lopsided in the Senate slash congressional elections, Republicans could win uh, around 64 Senate seats against the Democratic Party. 64 to 36. Think about how lopsided that Senate map would be. Now, this is not the likeliest outcome, nor is it likely. But it is a possibility. There is a realm of possibility in the multiverse in which you see all of these states vote red. Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, all three of which have voted red on the presidential level in the 21st century. In fact, Montana can be added in there. Wisconsin can be added in there. Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Virginia. Ten states alone that have already voted red in the 21st century have voted red in some shape or form in the past 10 years, that in 2024 could end up voting red. And that would bring Republicans from 53 in my most recent projection for 2022 to 63. And all you would have to do is add in the state that is continuously a battleground, the state of Minnesota. So 2024 is not a map that can be simply just messed around with and treated like it's not uh, an election that needs to be taken super seriously. In fact, it probably is the election that needs to be taken the most seriously by the Democratic Party. And no amount of preparation from 2022 can prepare them for just the political uncertainty and, uh, I guess, lopsided against them type of map that 2024 will bring. Even if Democrats, let's say, for instance, in my best case for 2022, win 52 Senate seats, right? They win 52 to 48. 
that puts the Democrats at a good position. But let's say they lose West Virginia and Montana. Well, that alone will bring the Democratic Party down to 50-50. And if a GOP Republican slash GOP president is in office, Republicans get the majority. But let's say there isn't. Let's say Biden's reelected, right? What about the remaining states? They have no type of state that they can fall back on and say, we can afford to lose these. Once West Virginia and Montana go, it's a done deal. Now, it's not a done deal to say Montana is gone, but West Virginia, I would argue, definitely is in a position where it's not going to vote for Joe Manchin again. But the other thing that I need to circle back before we end this video is that not only do Democrats have numerous losses, uh, possibilities in this 2024 map, it is also very real uh, and a harsh reality for Democrats that they have nowhere to expand besides two Senate seats on this map. The only places they will be competitive in in 2024, if everything else remains the same as it is right now, is Texas and Florida. And if Republicans continue with Rick Scott in Florida and maintain his levels and approvals amongst the Florida people, if Republicans are able to expand with Ted Cruz in Texas, Democrats might not even have possibilities of winning either of those two states. And I think that while they will be competitive, Democrats are going to be spending so much money playing defense. They're going to be spending so much time and effort in a number of these states that were not competitive in 2018, were not competitive in 2012, 2006, or even 2000, but are undoubtedly competitive for 2024. And those states are going to really take away the energy, resources, and money from states like Florida and Texas that would have been prime targets for Democrats, but are seemingly out of reach for 2024 and truly the only opportunities for Democrats in this election year. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already and check out the Instagram and Twitter. At the bottom left of the screen, there's also a Discord server for you to go ahead and join. On the screen, there's a video you can watch and then a playlist for my 2024 election analysis videos. Again, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all tomorrow.